Hello and welcome to Power Reflections, a proud member of the Doof Network, where we reflect on Wabo's most unfinished work as it releases. I'm Ruben Morehouse. And I'm Elliot Diebold. And we are here live on the main stage, the podcast main stage coming at you live. <laughs> Huzzah! Huzzah. Feel that um, roar of the crowd, Elliot. <laughs> it's it's palpable. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wanted before we before we get into the chat today, I just wanted to introduce the the new outro thing we're going to do here. Particularly, yep. it's mostly for the live audience because um, we're going to do well. So basically, for those who don't, <laughs> for those Jesus who don't Christ. know, um, <laughs> in the Pale in Comparison channel, I have a habit of dropping other verse themed pickup lines. And this has led Jenny and uh, also Malia to claim that they think I have some games. So in order to prove them wrong, I'm going to start delivering them in the podcast so everyone can see how terrible they are. Um, But what we want is the audience to rate them from a scale of... What did we decide? I don't remember what we decided there. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's right. From uh, yeah, the suaveness of a pickup line from the scale on a scale of Alexander to Alexander. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that so so I'll be doing one of those at the end of the episode, and if if those of you in the live chat can let us know how suave you think it is, that would be helpful for uh, our data analysis. Yeah, perfect. All right, we'll we'll track that and put it into a spreadsheet later, shall we? <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Um, so that's a little teaser for the end of the episode. So stick around until then if you want to hear that. <laughs> now, <laughs> let's get into uh, finish off twenty four ten. With uh, we're in Verona's head, at least for the first half, I guess. Um, so yeah, the fairies get what they bargain for, but Jude gets more than he bargained for as he escorts the Kenneteers. Yes, and I love the word choice, uh, escorts there, um, both by you and the story. Uh, I thought that mm. was really fun. Mm. He's just such a goober, Jude. I He's- love him. He's just so similar to Avery, right? Like, that's what <laughs> yeah. this segment really made me feel, is it's the way Verona is messing with him is the exact same way that Verona was messing yes. with Avery and continues to mess with Avery, um, but <laughs> in that Blue Heron Institute scene specifically, right? Like yes, the, yeah. It's just so... They're just so exactly the same. <laughs> it's hilarious. I can't wait for the for the love triangle where they both have a crush on the same girl. Um, I think that's going to be very fun. Yeah. And she'll probably have similar crushes on both of them because they're yeah. basically the same fucking person. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Jude always being, like, the male Avery is... You're right. It's just always funny. And he's got, like, I don't know, like, his awkward teen... I found this very relatable. Like, at his age, 100%, I would have had the same reaction to Lucy asking me to draw on her. Like, a mm. girl asking me to do something like that, I would have been, like, freaking the fuck out. And so, like, I, I, but of course, like, I, I just love all their reactions. Like, Avery tries to help. Lucy's just kind of befuddled and goes on the offense. And Verona is just shit stirring. Like, it's just yep. such a funny scene for all four of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, uh, it's very fun times. And it's the exact kind of shenanigans that is so fun in this story, right? Like, despite yeah. the fact that we're in, you know, ostensibly the end game of this story, there's still time for, shenanigans like this i can't i tried to think of a different word and there just is no better word yeah, no. <laughs> yeah i do think this brings up like a really interesting sort of conversation though like like what lucy's talking about here like with priorities because i can't decide whether i agree or disagree with lucy on what she's talking about here um like she's very much you know the stakes are too high it's serious business right now I don't have time to think about stuff like that. Like you're, you're kind of an idiot. If mm-hmm. you're thinking about stuff like that, like be serious. Mm-hmm. And I mean, she's right. Like <laughs> shit's really serious right now, but also I, like, I don't know. That doesn't feel healthy at the same time. Like it, like this is the moment where you are meant to kind of be back and, and recharging. And part of me is like, wouldn't it be healthier to uh, like, you know, maybe not do what Verona's doing, but kind of like enjoy, like enjoy the little moments like this. Like if you're not fighting for a dorky teenage boy to be awkward, what are we fighting for? You know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, like the right to live and live a life that is not just an existence, but also silly sometimes. Like that's the joy of what they're fighting for. Right. Yeah, like it's it, uh, you know, and Lucy herself has said this in the story. Like there was that moment uh, during the Musser invasion where she like used the glamour to fix Chloe's sweater or something. That was the thing where she's like, "This is what we're fighting for." Is the nice moments like this? 
And mm. I was like, where's that part of Lucy right now? Like this is this is the mm. stuff that I feel like has Jasmine rightfully concerned. Is like I don't I, I struggle to say Lucy's wrong here because the stakes are so high and like I guess you do need to be businessy, but like she's just it feels like she's turning into a bit of a soldier in moments like this and it mm. worries me at the same time. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, you're right. It's it's her becoming more I don't know, claimed by war. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, or or just yeah, willingly subsuming herself to it, and even if that's a temporary thing, like it makes sense, but also doesn't. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm yeah. I'm so interested to see where the story ends up taking this Lucy Jasmine Lucy War stuff because I don't know what I think the answer is. Mm. Um, I don't know. I, I, mm. I my part of the problem here is I think I'm much more on the Verona side of things. Like my coping mechanism is to just make stupid jokes that people think are obnoxious yeah. so uh, i can't really get my head around lucy's side of it yeah 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 hmm yeah i don't know you're right i i mean it's a bit it's fair to be a bit worried about her but it's also a pretty rough situation so yeah like it, like if there was a time for lucy to be like this it, it's probably mm. now. like like yeah. she's not she's not wrong that this is the time and place mm. yeah yeah um, can we talk about, let's talk about these little fairies, shall we? Uh, because the text yeah. does explicitly compare them to like the low tier goblins, like Pekka and yeah. Cherry, which I think is really accurate. I guess like they just mainly are picking up on vibes. And I guess it was just kind of funny to me to see how similar these goblins yeah. and fairies were, right? Like it's kind of silly, but they're almost identically vibed. Yeah, the more we see of fairies, the more it's like all the shit that the story's been telling us about how Fae and Goblin are the same shit kind of adds up. Like, you could see Toad Slow interacting with fairies must have been one of the first big clues he had because, mm. um, yeah, yeah, like, the the way Verona plays the fairies here reminds me a lot of that famous chicken nugget scene from, I think it was 2.6, like, where Verona realised she could play the goblins off each other by not sharing out prizes and stuff anyway here she realizes she can manipulate them because they thrive on like attention and games so if she makes it like an attention giving competition then there's it's like there's like subtle differences like they're not the same thing but they're so fucking similar like it's just different flavors of the same uh as is a did it in chat has called it kindergarten core and it's like it is the same mm. yeah 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 it's just so fun i don't know <laughs> um it's it's also worth pointing out that this was brought to my attention in the live read um i well, i was joking all these fairies you know how they're using like the measurement system like a sprinkling versus a drop versus a dash um mm. i was making a joke about that's how the imperial system sounds to those of us in the rest of the world <laughs> um and apparently yeah. this is real imperial they're all real imperial measurements Mm. Like Wabo didn't make these up. This is this is real. Mm. Mm. So I just yeah. thought that was a fun detail. Yeah, that's wild. <laughs> but I guess <laughs> the the fairies using an archaic and strange, you know, system of measurement that people might think is fake, but then they get to go, actually, no, it's real. Is very fairy. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I don't know. I'm just amazed. Like, yeah, you know. When a recipe apparently says add a dash of something, like apparently there's kind of a real measurement you could use for that. I just assumed a dash was like, you know, just chuck some shit in that, you know, is a dash. Like I didn't realize there was actually an amount that that corresponded to. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. But yeah, I don't know. If, if, if fairies really want to get into the game, like even drug deals have switched to metric in the US, I'm pretty sure. So mm. that's, that's what they should get into. Mm. Um, there's also an angle here, like, okay, Verona and the girls, they're basically scamming these fairies too, right? Like, like Verona's making a big deal about how these temporary, tos are, uh, temporary tattoos are really cool because they won't break like glamour. And it's like, I guess that's technically true, but like, unless they build temporary tattoos really differently in, the, in Canada, they're going to fucking break in a couple of hours in different ways, right? Like, it's, mm. it, 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 they're kind of... <laughs> I, and I mean, you know, it's fairies, so it's probably fair game to, like, it, you know, it, it, they probably respect you more if you scam them a little bit. But I was like, I don't know, this feels like a scam. Yeah, I wonder how good temporary tattoos are nowadays. Like, 
Well, Walbo's but, in I the mean, chat saying they're pretty good, so maybe I'm just wrong. Yeah, I wonder how they la- how long they last. How long can a good temporary tattoo last? I've just never had one that didn't like start peeling and cracking within like a couple of hours. Yeah, but these are the ones that I'm thinking of ones that you get like in a packet of gum and are like, you know, yeah, shit, <laughs> like cost five cents. You know what I mean? So yeah, so like I'm getting something saying temporary tattoos can last anywhere, but f- like a week, two weeks ish. Um, but then like you know, well, it's probably better than glamour to be fair. Um, like. Henna can last like weeks to a month or two months, right? So that's pretty long as well. Yeah. Well, these weren't henna. No, I know. But, you know, like there's no rule that says that temporary skin tattooing or marking or whatever can't last like. uh, Yeah. If if it's like two weeks, I would consider that pretty fair deal. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I was was thinking that like 20 minutes after the Kennedys left the room, the shit would be peeling. The fairies would be like, what? Um, yeah, like, and people in the chat are bringing up this moment that I also wanted to bring up. I guess part of the reason it felt so like the Kennedys were trying to milk them is like there's that moment at the start where this little fairy wants like whatever's on Verona's piece of paper and Verona won't mm. give it to her. And I was mm. just like, ah, what's the, like, what? Just give her what's on the piece of paper. Like, it's not, that's not asking too much. Like, <laughs> yeah, sure. It's just the whole yeah. vibe here. They're just, they're just been so. And I mean, I guess because the Kennedys need to get all the glamour they can, but it's just mm. like the whole vibe here was just yeah, um, so tight ass. <laughs> yeah, what's going to be on that piece of paper? Probably just some words or something. It's probably not not anything. Well, yeah, it might be a couple of drawings. Just redo the drawings, and then sh- yeah. and then the fairy can have what's on the piece of paper. And Verona like, puts her hand on the paper to stop the the fairy. Just like let her have what's on the paper. It's probably fine. <laughs> well, I, I don't. Nah, you couldn't. You couldn't pull that shit. You, you, that that's like surely that wouldn't hold up in in judge court <laughs> um but yeah so the trio are negotiating for a bunch of glamour and just kind of chit-chatting about the crucible and planning at the time um uh, yeah and uh, it's worth calling out the at the end of this they get what what they describe as less than half what they get from marissa and Guillaume. um and it's just like one of those reminders i guess while i'm kind of raggy on them for maybe being tired asses here um we forget like the silver spoon they were awoken with in uh, in their mouth like i i guess because they didn't appreciate it at the time either but like the kennedy has got awoken with a really good deal and it's like now that part of that's gone we're really appreciating how good a deal it was because they have to work to get less than what they'd get for free before mm. yeah and like that really matters now that they're gain said yeah yeah it's um it is interesting isn't it i feel like we've had uh Moments like this in the story, the the like using up all their tools moments. You know what I mean? Um, when the witch hunters were in town, that was a big yeah. And Verona yeah. was gain set. That was that was one of it for me. Of like, it really changes the dynamic and makes you feel the resource constraints more. I guess I would say um, it's really fun. <laughs> I yeah. really like it. Yeah, like I yeah, I, we'll talk more I think later on in the chapter about how well this one's setting up the like the consequences of the gainsaying for the Kennedys, but this is like this part of all is like this chapter opens with like, okay, so we're going said, what are our like other tools? And it's them having to work and haggle to get like a shittier amount of glamour than they're even used to. Like mm. which sort of sets the stage for where they're at mentally with um uh, with their supplies right now. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also really like how the three of them kind of not through their own thoughts on the crucible. Like, yeah, I think they kind of explain the question I had last week about why Charles wants people to have to walk through like thousands of years of history. Like it, it hadn't occurred to me, but it really does make sense. If you're building this sit, like the crucible on the assumption that one person needs to be brilliant enough to build the perfect system and see all the angles, I guess it makes sense that you'd need them to have lived a long enough time to have had all these diverse experiences like uh, if we're working off the assumption that charles's plan is good which is admittedly a hell of an assumption like i do i see that logic now as to why you would need people to go to live a long time and experience all these systems because it's charles's shitty way of getting them more angles like he's not letting them live lives as others and stuff which i would argue is an important step of that like let Mm. them be a little goblin for a bit and stuff but um it I, I can see where his logic is now, and I didn't get that before the Kennedy has spelt it out. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I do think but also, like, it's a bad plan. 
because oh yeah uh, well uh, yeah obviously obviously we're all in a group but like i just the big thing for me is now that we learn that like a successful person will have presumably lived through multiple lifetimes it's like maybe i'm a bit ageist but i just don't have faith that many people who've been through that much will be as proactive about change i get like I'm thinking, you know, you know, people who've survived thousands of years and lived through like pre-seal, early seal, late seal. It's like the Bjorgman. It's like the Alabaster. Like these aren't fucking champions of changing shit. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. It's yeah, it's a bad plan. <laughs> I guess yeah. you can just say it's a bad plan. Um, ha- having said that, there is a quote here where when they're talking about the Crucible, uh, Jude says that his family would probably think Aries a shoe in for for the <laughs> crystal, right? Which I think is a really funny point because, like, if anyone's going to solve a world-altering ritual, it would be Avery. Like, that, that that is so classic. No, so what I think, if Avery tried to go into the Crucible, I think the Page of Sons would show up and, and block it and be like, no, 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 I thought no. dibs on this one. <laughs> she's already she's rebuilding mine. my world. Yes. She, she can't Sorry. rebuild your world too. <laughs> Sorry, I got... <laughs> I got dibs on world altering Avery rituals. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean, you know, obviously, I think a big thing the uh, the fandoms <laughs> talked a lot about is the idea of the trio um, winning the Crucible if it gets active, and I, I, I think there's more, to, probably more to it than just that. But like, I guess if you had to pick one, Avery, I, I see. I don't know because if it's Charles's Crucible, I feel like it's mm. going to be mean, and like Avery, Avery sucks at that side of it, like. I actually don't know that Avery would be a shoe in because I feel like Charles's version is going to require you to do some fucked up shit. And I think like Lucy would maybe be the best suited for that part. Mm. Or Verona, perhaps. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Avery does have her wolf, wolf mask. That's a good point. Yeah. Anyway, it's all moot because the Page of Sons has dips. Yeah. Oh. Um. Uh- so I also there's like tons of little fun moments um in in throughout this like we called that out with the Jude stuff earlier but like there's some great there's the great moment with Snowdrop bringing up the bop pimples um to try and humble Avery and uh I love the moment where Lucy is kind of like it's your fault for taking goblin adjacent familiar and Avery's like she wasn't that goblin adjacent when I took her and mm. I'm so glad Verona was there to call out what a bad argument that is because it's like oh so i'm sorry so being your familiar made her more goblin adjacent is what you're saying like that's a shit argument and mm. it's just it, it's like the fun vibes that the three of them are having i mean this is exactly what i was complaining about with lucy before is like the three of them just shooting the shit while they're resting like this is feels so healthy and good and like it's like a big thing we see a lot in this chapter, I think, is like these moments where these three are just in sync, like despite their differences. Um, I think there's like a number of moments where like Lucy needs to get kicked by Verona because mm. she's accidentally insulting Jude and Verona sort of has to like silently be like, yo, like say something nice to Jude, please. And then Lucy returns the favor. Like there's that moment where Lucy's like, I'm going to call my mom and then just sort of stares at Verona and Verona's like, Oh uh, yeah, me too. Like it's what's different between yeah the Arc Twelve Kinetiers and the current Kinetiers is like the now their differences don't cause them to fall out of sync, but they can just kind of read each other and communicate, and they just they just feel like they're in a really good place as a trio in this mm. chapter. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they are, aren't they? They 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 feel very aligned. They feel like they're all strongly on the same page and ready to fuck with Charles yeah and like you know in avery's bit you know in a moment like she's gonna have these complaints because you know like she feels like her communication with snowdrop in particular is stunted because of the gain saying um but like her and snowdrop have a number of moments where they just like where there's that bit where they corner vaughn without needing to communicate they've just like they've got a good routine and they know yeah how to communicate even when they can't or they don't need to communicate anymore and so there's just a lot of moments like that with all of them where it's like without their power they're still synergized so much as a trio slash quartet and it's like great to see if you have a familiar so yeah i I, how much is their bond severed you know what i mean like while while gain said i think it's just like the cool psychic communication stuff that's Mm. gone like i think they're still Mm. familiar and all that it's just like 
Yeah. Yeah, like all the all the pro they can't uh, send power magic anything. shit you can do. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah interesting. Interesting. Um speaking of things getting cut off by being gainsaid, I think it was interesting <laughs> Lucy <laughs> has lost some of her fighting lessons. Yeah. <laughs> which, I mean, I guess it makes a lot of sense obviously, but it's just kind of funny to me that like sh- her fighting is magical. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like she's I mean, learned how to throw a punch, but she can only do it when she has access to magic. I, I mean, you know, it's just kind of, it is a bit silly. <laughs> it's just yeah, hilarious. but then on the other hand, like as Mirth Strikes pointing out in the chat, this is exactly my point. It's like she dodges rain. Like, I know, I know. Like I know. she's supernaturally <laughs> talented. So if anything, this makes more, like I'd be more concerned if while game said Lucy can still dodge rain. Dodge rain. Like, yeah, you're right. But it's just funny to be like, it is. I'm a really good fighter and I can, you know, <laughs> it's like well, she's juicing, you know? It's, yeah, because your good. fighting ability feels like it would just be an inherent In a part thing of like that you've skill. learned. Yes. Yeah, skill you've earned. Like, and then, like, so it's like, yeah, it's like, it's different from, say, Avery with her path boons, because to be like, yes. well, that was a blatant magical enhancement I got. And when that gets taken away, it's like, oh, that makes sense. It was not like intrinsically a part of me whereas yeah like yeah. if you learnt to play the violin and then it was just like oh now you can't play the violin because that was magic <laughs> i'd be like but but i that's what i do i play yes, the violin yes, like yes <laughs> but uh, yeah obviously the difference is if you can play the violin so well that you can shoot raindrops with music notes or whatever <laughs> i don't know but yeah. it is just yeah. very funny conceptually I, I just found it hilarious no um, yeah i completely agree um I do think, like, it is also, I guess, like, this, because this is that section of the chapter where um, Verona is really kind of leading the other two through, like, a bit of a stock take. They're like, what do we have? What works? What doesn't? Like, this is where it's like, oh, yeah, Lucy's earring kind of still works. Um, And I, like, I guess I just thought it was interesting because we're about to jump into Avery's section and Avery is really feeling the gain saying, like, she, 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 thinks running is a little bit hard, which is like big Verona energy from her. Um, you know, her feet get hurt when she does 30 foot jumps. Like it, it's fundamentally changing how she operates as a practitioner that she's gainsaid. And you don't really feel that at all for Verona in this section. And hers was less combat oriented, but it, it just feels like a bit of a thing. Like, I guess Verona is going to thrive more when gainsaid because she is this like Jack of all trades practitioner. So she has, she doesn't rely on any tool, I guess, including her own inherent magical ability. Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, also, she gets gainsaid, like, twice a week, so, like, she's just used to it, I suppose. But um, I, I think more importantly, it is also a testament to the way, like, Verona just spreads her skill set out. Like she, I, I think this is exactly the sort of thing, or, or, like, part of her internal thing, where she doesn't like to have all her eggs in one basket for exactly this kind of reason. Mm, yeah. 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 Very fair. Very fair vibe for Verona. I mean, that's the funny thing, right? Verona was planning for this. I mean, not for this exact situation. The situation Verona was planning for was the parents taking away the power, but yeah. she's so yeah, prepared that, that it just kind of fans out. You're right. Yeah, I suppose that's the other thing. She was ready for this eventuality. There's probably like multiple reasons why. Yeah, she's just coping a lot better than Avery does in her own segment. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the trio all make a few phone calls, checking in with people and saying possible goodbyes. Except Avery, who's up to some shenanigans that we don't find out what it is at first. But oh boy, does it pay off! I think she talks to her mum as well. I think it's the trio. Trio does mum. It's like their Mother's Day. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't know when Mother's Day is in in Canada. It may not be. Probably Mother's today. Day. So you know, text your mum, <laughs> Canadians. Um. And you know, Florin, Florin, Florin's uh, Avery's magical mum, right? Um, mm. But yeah, uh, I, I love how we don't see Lucy's call to her mum at all. Like we know it's quick, but that's all we get. Verona is not really in it, her space to watch Lucy too closely, and it's just like again, this build up of the tension between Lucy and Jazz has been in the oven for a pretty long time now. Um, mm. And I still don't, I, as I said before, I still don't quite know where I expect the story to go with 
with this whole angle of Lucy and going to war and stuff, and I'm just so excited every time we see anything between Lucy and Jazz. I'm like, I'm just so ready for this to pop out. I can't wait. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it'll be fun when I, yeah. So it was interesting to me. Well, so Verena has a call with Sylvia, right? Um, and that was such a tearjerker kind of vibes. Like it was rough and it was still pretty awkward, but it does feel like their relationship is improving. But the thing that I'm excited for is it didn't feel, we're not at a series wrap on the parents yet. You know what I mean? Like oh, we're definitely 100%. not there yet. I, and I'm really excited for the moment where the parents come in after the Kennedys have had a big showdown and I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, yeah. but I'm excited I- for it. That's I have no idea how Walbo plans to yes. fit these pieces together. Yes, because yeah, yes. you're right. There's there's some real shit cooking up with their parents and their innocent lives, yeah. and it's merging with their magical lives. Because like that's I think the story this story especially compared to Pact has really been defined by that blend of magical and and innocent lives, and now they're starting to come together, and it feels like we're heading for something where those collide at a climactic moment, but I, t- I have no clue what that looks like. And I'm so excited for it. Mm, like yeah. what is Jasmine, Sylvia, Kelsey and Connor coming in during the magical climax to bring that thread in at the same time, even look like I don't. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, for sure. Can't wait. It's so interesting. Like, yeah. yeah. The fact that we don't know what the reaction is going to be like is very cool. Yeah. Um, I also really wanted to talk. I loved this section where Sylvia is talking about Brett um, because like it's great for starters, because Sylvia is like the best window into what Brett used to be like for us, both because she married that version of him. So she obviously saw something at some point. Um, And then also she's kind of the person who's had the least to do directly with the current version of Brett. Like, so she's the one who's Mm. still hanging on to the old version of Brett in her head the most. Yes. So she's like the best person to talk about the version of Brett that was a human. Um, and I guess, yeah. like, yeah, like these details we learned, like, we knew he'd made the costumes for Verona, but like hearing Sylvia say, I think this was the first time I really appreciated that, like, Brett was the crafty and the create the artsy one. And like, that is a huge part of Verona. Like, she's taken that from him. And like, I guess I'd never really appreciated how, how much she, yeah, got that from him. And like, th- that adds a whole new angle to like the fact you know he smashed all her art supplies was like a big thing early in the story that like one of the moments they'd had before the story started was when he broke yeah. all her art supplies and it's like he he knew what that was if he was the artsy fartsy one he he knew what a dick move that was like Elliot, it's have, have you ever heard of that japanese art where they uh, repair broken things with gold yes, with gold yeah yeah mm-hmm. So really, Brett was just trying to introduce her to a new art form, and she <laughs> failed to learn the lesson that he was trying to teach her. He's a good parent the whole time. Oh, he's, he's he's as hard done by as Grayson Henniger, isn't he? <laughs> like you know, he's got this coddled daughter who just doesn't learn the lessons that he's trying to yeah. impart on her. These poor parents in this story. Yeah, um, Fern is such a bad child. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do think like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I just, I found it fascinating that like, uh, it's like, oh, Brett was the crafty one. Yes. And Sylvia yeah, no, is it is the, very interesting. Yeah. And then Sylvia is like the jack of all trades. And cause like you, like Verona is the combo of those two, right? Like, yeah. this is the thing we've talked about a lot with the, with the parents, uh, or the awareness is like how much you see them in the Kenneteers and like Verona is seemingly just the combination of the best aspects of both of her parents. Mm. Um, right down to the eventually leaving Brett part. Um, and yeah, like, I don't know. I just thought that was really cool. Cause I guess it's so easy. Like Brett is in such a bad place. It's so easy to build him up as just a monster. And I kind of like these moments where we remember he used to be a functional human being. Mm, yeah. 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 I mean, obviously there had to have been a reason that Sylvia fell in love with him originally. Yeah. Right? And that, that person feels so far away from, the Brett that we've seen what, what through Verona's know. eyes. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, but yeah, it's interesting like, to know, like, this is who he was, I guess. The the guilt that Sylvia has for doing this to him, I also think is really fascinating because it's like, uh, there's like maybe a little bit of truth to that feeling. Like, 
but also god no like uh, like i think i think that would be a fascinating thing to explore if we had like a sylvia interlude at some point because uh, like i don't like i wouldn't say it's her fault or anything but like you know uh, like like i guess you know uh, i don't know it's it's a complicated issue whether or not you can hold her at all responsible for what brett has become because mm. yeah like that's that's a that's a deeply chaotic line to get into i kind of want to see it explored yeah well i mean i don't think resp- holding sylvia responsible is correct because no. nobody's responsible but you know brett is who brett is but yeah yeah and like like again you know uh, what i tend to come back to what is it's it's like kenneth above's fault really because it's like sylvia was clearly aromantic or, or something mm. and she mm, largely seems to have married brett out of like a sense of well that's just what i'm meant to do mm. um and and so like it's like the the co- the closest thing that i guess to saying like if you wanted to blame sylvia what you'd argue is that like it was kind of unfair to do the whole going through with marriage thing and let brett fall in love with her or whatever mm. when that wasn't what you wanted mm. but then it's not fair to blame sylvia for that because it's like she didn't know that that was an option yeah um i'm as impressed points out yeah she also cheated on him so there's like i don't know there's like this smidgen of truth that i think yeah yeah like the guilt she has i can see why that's a kernel that sits with her and like can't really be dismissed and i think that that'd be yeah i i don't know i find that really interesting yeah it's a complex uh situation yeah for sure yeah um also just so speaking of aromanticism and i know i'm like poking a hot stove uh by bringing this up again but um there are a few moments where verona is like you know she thinks of anselm and she's like heartbroken essentially um and i i feel like that's a really important part of like representing verona as like an aromantic character or whatever because it's like she's not heartbroken in that she lost like a boyfriend but it's like she lost a friend and like like you know he like I, i guess she, like aromanticism doesn't mean she's a robot right like she's mm. she, she still liked him as a person and they, like they were having a lot of fun hanging out together so it's like uh, I, I think it's really cool that it's like we're still getting to see that side of i uh, like y- you know i guess what what her relationships or lack thereof like look like i think that that's probably really important to the good representation of like an aromantic relationship mm. yeah 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 i think so um but yeah so the 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 trio heads back to the battlefield and they pull out a few key innocents and aware to use in some upcoming scuffles <laughs> yeah well, including george who quickly becomes a bit of a standout for the chapter i think <laughs> yeah uh, george he's just so here for it you know it, which is very <laughs> funny um i it's it's very fun that he's brought in just to fuck with the white run he's like yeah i'm here what can i do okay yeah we've made it what do i need to do and every's like you've done it it, pal he's like which is sorry can i just say that's the dream like imagine being able to walk into a room it's like what do you need me for it's like mate you've already done everything we could possibly need of you (laughs) yeah yeah um yeah that's rough poor george (laughs) he just wants to help just let let the boy help what he's just like, I don't know, he just has the best vibes. Like, like you know, he gets subsumed by the white rot and it bites him and stuff. And Avery's like, Are you okay? And he's like, Well, I said I wanted to see what technomancy was like. Yeah. Um, which is just a funny wisecrack in the in a death defying situation. Verona's right. It's good shit. Um, yeah. He also, um, oh, what, he has another moment that I, I was just thinking of and it slipped from my mind. But yeah, he, I don't know, he's just absolutely on fire. Um, I love, I love that he was a girl, um, in the horn. That wasn't the one I was thinking of, but like all the stories from the horn are great. Um, I love Vaughn, the chew toys, uh, being raised by weird bug creatures. Mm. Oh yeah. It was the healing potions. It was, it was the healing potions. I love that. Like Avery's like, we have healing potions and he's like, that's so yeah. fucking cool. And Avery's like, it's really not. And I was like, no, no, no. Let him experience <laughs> it. Is. That's part of the fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is cool. You know, you're just yeah. jaded, Avery, right? <laughs> yeah. You get one stomach pumping and suddenly healing potions aren't cool. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So, again, I mean, I know we talked about this, I think, 
pretty pretty recently with the innocents on the battlefield but the fact that everyone just kind of has to duck behind corners <laughs> yeah it's so good. liberty dashing around a corner so they don't see her crazy jetpack is so funny to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah i agree i kind of wish th- I, like I, this is something i want to see more of like i'm thinking right back to i think the first time the kennedy's fought zed this happened where like a car <laughs> drove up and like everyone had to pretend that they weren't doing a magical fight and it's just innocence on magical battlefields is always funny and Mm. i'm so glad that we're getting a bunch of it now even if like it's in this weird state because it's kind of like you can kind of break it sometimes now yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah so the the the, uh the white rot kind of springs a trap and starts to take over the cabin engulfing zed and george and everybody um and this is one of those moments where things just go from zero to 60 which is great yeah. uh I'm, yeah i'm glad we're finally getting to see this thing in action i feel like this is the one ward we've been hearing about the whole time we've been hearing about the lords and we've never really understood what it looks like so it's like yeah we're finally getting to see the white rot i'm, I'm excited i love it yeah s tier yeah um yeah it is good um uh, the top tier moment where it reads george's search history um (laughs) his defense is it was a meme and then it says your memes suck which is hilarious Uh, and again george uh, taking another w here because of all the things you could have in your search history this is really not that bad right um and if we think (laughs) back to a similar moment when the wolf absolutely savaged was it peter garrick i can't remember which garrick it was but they're um, they're all the same it was that that was an absolute savagery yeah. by the wolf. Whereas this is like, if this is the worst the White Rock can do, it's actually not that bad. If the White Rock got onto my internet search history at that <laughs> age, it could have hit me way harder. <laughs> uh, good like, times. Uh, and this is the thing: the thing about George in this chapter is, I feel like George must. It, it, I don't know if he's intentionally acting as some sort of audience surrogate or something, but I just kept agreeing with George on everything, like. Because there's a bit, you know, uh, we talked about how he was a girl in his horn or whatever, and he was like, oh, I wish I'd, like, used it to try some stuff. Mm. And some of the others call this out as gross. But I was there, and I'm like, maybe I'm just gross. But I was like, I mean, that just does seem like an interesting experiment to to undertake. I think George is right. Mm. Like, if you had the opportunity to experience how the other half lives, you should take it. Like, anyway, I, I'm team team George in this chapter. He's great. Yeah. George is, yeah, absolutely doing great stuff in this chapter. Yeah. yeah. I, and, and I like, I, I love now that we're seeing the white rot, I think like I, I'm starting to kind of get it as a thing. Cause like the, the thing with all technomancy is that like it merges actual technology with what like lay people think technology is. Right. And so it's like, like te- technomancy isn't about how technology works, but it's about how non-tech people think technology works. Mm. And so we've had things like the dropped call, which always like have a technological angle to stuff, but they're almost also like a pun. Like the dropped call literally drops bodies on you and that sort of thing. And like the white rot here, it's like this viral toxic ooze. And so of course the technomancy thing on a technological viral ooze is also like shitty twitter put downs like mm. like it feels like a shitty forum thread <laughs> all the stuff it's yeah. saying like I, like that is socially speaking that is the viral toxic ooze of the internet is all the kind of comments that the white rot makes about people and gets in your head and stuff like i love i love that yeah 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 it is good yeah and, and, you know, Zed's, Zed's almost outdoing it, though. Like, I love how he's got an antiviral syringe that becomes a vaccine. And, it, like, his syringe, instead of a needle in the end, has, like, a fucking one of those old mouse port. Thing. Like, that's so fucking stupid. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, yeah, like, that's that's uh, not what antivirus yeah. is. That's not what... Like, there's no such thing as a technological vaccine, but it's like... Yes, there technomancy- is. Don't, how dare you say that? Of course there is. <laughs> like... Technomancy just takes metaphors from other things and, like, jams it into technology and says, this metaphor works here now, and I love it. Well, but that's, like, what technology is a lot, right? Like, it is just metaphors of random things that then get kind of, like, extracted out in hilarious ways. Like, it's so technology. Yeah, but 
like tech dimensions. No, obviously like, not ignores... to this extent, but still. Sure. But that's what I mean. I guess that's what, what I love about technomancy is it, is it, do, it doesn't rely at all on technology. In fact, I think one of the first things Walbo taught us about technomancy is that specifically having an understanding of technology is a disadvantage to understanding technomancy because you don't want to actually understand technology. You want to understand how people who don't understand technology understand technology. And that's, that's so fun because it lets them bring in all these other metaphors, like use the concept of antivirus to and like twist it into something that's more useful, even though that's not how technology works. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like the big red button is, is such a great example of it. Like, yeah, Technomancers, we all just have a big red button that makes all technology stop. Because mm. that's what big red buttons do. The, the movies have taught us this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, before, before we move on from this section, I just also want to call out a, a little snowdrop moment where... Uh, Avery saves the day by basically letting Innocence into the room. Um, And one of them asks what happened here, and Snowdrop replies, nothing. (laughs) Everything happened here. Yeah, what did she she say in her head? What is the opposite of nothing? Because everything is like, that can't be what she said. But (laughs) this is one of those little Snowdrop moments where I'm like, she's so overpowered. It's great that they had her to say that here. But yeah, like what? (laughs) I wonder what that sounded like from Snowdrop's point of view. Mm, yeah yeah <laughs> uh, yeah everything i think everything happened here I, I, like i could see that anyway uh, well people in the chat are saying maybe she said like so much or whatever but i would have yeah. thought the opposite of that would be like oh not much like yeah, you know, so which, which would have been yeah, a exactly. funnier response no the opposite <laughs> of nothing is everything snowdrop is saying everything happened here <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess um oh, also sorry can we talk about whatever is going on with verona and gillette here because they seem to have swapped places or something. Gillette seems to be rocking Verona's mask. Mm. And then Gillette rubs her palm later. Mm. So, like, I feel like the obvious read for what's going on here is that Gillette and Verona have swapped places because Verona's pulling shenanigans, because that yes. sounds like Verona. And, of course, Verona and Gillette's big trick would be using each other as duplicates because that's what they are like that's that's some fucking marissa katir well yeah it's the exact it's like what was her name the fairy that marissa subbed uh, out with the, yeah it's the finia strat right um yeah charles is gonna come in he's gonna gain saver and be like oh you're gain said for this thing and <laughs> gillette is gonna be like <laughs> you fuck you just gain said <laughs> yourself surely charles could see through it though <laughs> I mean, I surely, but we'll see. I, I had a big brain thought. At what I was really actually hoping, my thought during the live read was that they'd gotten Florin to do a spell that had swapped their names. So this was really Verona, but now everyone calls her Gillette. And then similarly, Gillette is Gillette, but everyone calls her Verona. And I don't, but mm. I don't think that's what it is anymore. But I just want to put it out there that I thought that would be a really fun plan. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, yeah, so, I, I, I don't know. you're right. Something's going on. We'll see. I like because uh, I guess Verona has said that she's doing the Avery role. Like they're mm. all switching roles for a bit, which of course, as we know, always goes well for them. Um, and if so, if Verona is doing the Avery role. She's meant to be coming in from the flanks. So I guess it makes sense that her way of doing that when she's not really a runner is to make everyone think she's in the middle of things, but not be. Mm. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, can't, yeah, can't wait to see. Can't wait to see what Verona and uh, Gillette uh, are up to. Yeah, we will. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Leave your predictions on what they're up to in the show notes, <laughs> I guess. Um, but yeah, so uh, next, uh, Helen shows up, and we get the Helen showdown. Um, Helen is kind of holding them all back, but uh oh, there's some traps <laughs> that Helen <laughs> pops, and whoops, there she goes. <laughs> Oh, it's so good. I this moment was great. The Florin reveal. I'm like, I'm so glad they weren't just using Florin as a fucking mediator when he clearly mm-hmm. lived for that shit. Yeah, this is great Florin usage. Yes, it's so satisfying. Florin has really been, other than his Halloween party, Florin has been the thing that is like, you know, so hyped up. Um, the most hyped up in the story. So getting him to finally make his make his play here is very good. Yeah, and I just love the uh, like the big brain aspect to this 
playing because like it's like what Avery already calls out is like their plan at the face of it that Helen knew about was already seemingly they're making it confusing because there's aware, there's innocence, there's practitioners, there's others. They've got like every category of being here. So you have to account for everything. And it's like, that's what people think the trick is. And so like Helen's here and she's really like arrogant because she's like, I can fight aware, innocence, others and practitioners all at once. I'm that great. And then it's like, oh, but we also seeded in some ones who aren't the category you think they are. And we've just like fucked the categories right up. And that's so good. Mm. Mm. Yeah yeah <laughs> and yeah and they're helping uh, foreign like use his practice in a good way like this was with consent yes yes pauline pauline's got Paul- someone to keep her company when she's lost it's great <laughs> well it's so good that pauline is the lead into this because you get the cackling and the weirdness from pauline and you're like oh is this another facet of her awareness yeah. like is this the monster that that's like in the tunnel or whatever and and then you're kind of like, oh, have they kind of found a way to tap into that? Oh, that's cool. And then it keeps going and you're like, oh, no, it's so much worse. It's so much more <laughs> awesome. It's great. It's so <laughs> satisfying. Yeah. And, you know, you love to see it happen to someone like Helen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you think um, Helen's – how how gone is Helen, do you think? Well, my understanding is that people make it back from Pauline's thing relatively quickly. So – yes. She'll be back. It's just uh, a hope, well, presumably the hope is after we've dealt with Charles, after in which case she's going to come back and just get absolutely stomped on by <laughs> everyone else. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Um, but don't worry, Helen's not the only one who's been dealt with because Leonard also is here and also gets caught by an unexpected trap. Sheridan's awakened and is just as <laughs> tricksy as Avery. <laughs> The, the, the bit wait avery helps out here and we just have to call mm-hmm. out her fucking 30 foot drop so that she can say coup de face i'm in my head Bitch. i'm picturing her saying coup de face by the way <laughs> just because it's because she's gotten it wrong i just want her to have gotten it wrong in that way but when they so talk about like yeah I, I don't understand how she got it wrong because it's not it's it's, it's not coup de grace right it's coup de gras is how you pronounce it. So it doesn't rhyme with face. Right. But then it doesn't rhyme with ass either. I guess it's closer. Okay. Yeah. I would have said coup. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting it now. I'm, uh, yeah. But I'm catching up. The, coup so de, coup de, gras, coup de yeah. face or coup de face, which is still my head. So it'd have to be, it'd have to be coup de gras of a crew de farce. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> you got to put on like one of those like weird accents. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's good times. <laughs> It's just, it's such an Avery, like, like I, I, something that I think this chapter in particular seemed to be really, really good with is, like, foreshadowing stuff that was going to happen. Like, foreign stuff came up a lot. We got Sheridan Awakening foreshadowed multiple times, actually, because, like, uh, Verona's the one who brings out the Awakening ritual items. Um, and, yeah, like, again, one of the other foreshadowed things in this chapter is snowdrop calls out that avery's one-liners live rent free in her head when she's trying to sleep (laughs) and she comes out with the one that frankly should be causing her the most cringe as she tries to sleep at night because Mm -hmm. especially now that i know she got it wrong but it's just a a big 30 foot drop drop stomping on a guy's head and you follow it up with coop to face bitch it's so funny (laughs) um but it's sad that avery is gonna get forsworn because from this, unfortunately, because Sheridan says, was I badass? And Avery's response is, eh, which is obviously enough to get forsworn because <laughs> Sher- Sheridan was so badass. Um, so, yeah, I guess uh, Avery will get to live the forsworn experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Grey is excited. Um, oh, Awakening Sheridan is such a fun thing for the story to throw at us, and I love that it let, let her... Uh, like have this moment where yes, Avery helped yes. her do stuff, and you're yes. right. It, nothing's more badass than throwing tufts of pubes at people. Like it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's badass. Sheridan yeah, does it, a badass trap. Getting if you're Leonard and you get taken down by a first day practitioner, <laughs> like you have to admit that they're badass. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, and like this is so fun. This is absolutely going to have to tie into that stuff we were just talking about about like the the merging of the 
innocent side of their life and the magical side now that we've got the first Kennetier adjacent person to actually awaken I feel like we're going to have to follow that up mm. um, and of course it's Sheridan like Sheridan's great because she's trying so hard not to be or not to seem like she's a good sister but she just can't help but be one like mm. she's so fun yeah I can't I can't wait to see w- what else comes about from her being awoke yeah yeah, um, I agree. Also, so we get an extra wrinkle to the loser practice stuff here, where um, now when she goes to the Forest Driven Trail, Leonard's going to be there. Um, mm. So that's fun. Like, it sounds like she might have an even more interesting Forest Driven run than Avery did. Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, yeah, God. What, what is it going to be like? Do you think she's obligated to do it? Like, part of me is like, okay, if you lose something on a path mm. are you obligated to go and visit there go at back some to that point path and get it yeah because probably like, just not, like, in the what? sense of like it's like leaving trash behind in a national park you know yeah, <laughs> yeah well i guess because like i you know losing feels like it might be overpowered if you can just chuck because you just like pick a path that nobody that goes you, to yeah cakewalk and, cakewalk and, cakewalk <laughs> yes exactly like so so there must be something about like you must be planning to run it i would have said you had to have already run it except we know sheridan hasn't done that Mm -hmm. um but yeah like is there some obligation like if if she doesn't go at a certain point to visit leonard on the forest ribbon trail does he get unlost or something Mm -hmm. um i like i kind of just i just want to see more of sheridan's loser practice and what the because yeah like part of me is like why the forest ribbon trail like that's a bad choice unless it's a restriction unless you have to go there it's probably it it's probably a restriction yeah (laughs) <laughs> I wonder again, like, I, I wonder what the paths think about this. I mean, particularly Leonard, like, you, you, you know, the wolf's, the wolf's going to be pissed about this because even the wolf mm. doesn't want to hang out with the Leonard, probably. Mm. Like, I'm just imagining, like, what someone like the page must think about humans dumping their trash in the paths. Mm. Yeah. She's like, I like that Avery girl, but, oh, her sister drives me nuts. She keeps putting garbage here. <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> she litters on the path. So that is pretty funny. <laughs> the next time the page has a chat with Avery, it's good. she's going to be like, "Oh, you hear about Hazel stuff?" And he's like, "No, we need to talk about Sheridan." Yeah. She's Sheridan's been mess. dumping people all <laughs> over the paths, and it's inappropriate. <laughs> um, but yes, <laughs> so that's the kind of finale of the chapter is Sheridan's big entrance, um, which is great. It's a very fun ending, and uh, yeah, we're getting closer and closer to Charles's reemergence. Yep, and whatever the innocence side of that looks like with the parents, it's mm. yeah, hype. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's not the end of our episode yet, Elliot, because we have some predictions and a discussion question to revisit. Uh, let's start with our predictions. Um, well, mine isn't a prediction; mine is a comment from the Reddit thread, which I really liked. Uh, from Psycho Canuck, uh, who just kind of pointed out the sadness of Vaughn the Chew Toy, whose happy dream <laughs> of another life in the Horn world is him being rescued and raised by angry bugs, which is so perfect because, like, it probably is better than his life. So, like, you know, it fulfills the criteria of being a happy dream of a better life. But, like, I don't think his was happy. <laughs> based on his response well yeah true i don't know it just wasn't it wasn't great was it which i just think is no. very funny i love his idea though i like I, we didn't talk about it i love his pitch for his aware type to be called chew toy like i'm sure i'm sure there's some wanky like karmic sink type term for it but calling himself a chew toy really just sums it up I yes love it. it's perfect <laughs> um like i don't know I, I guess it's like you know clem's a gilded lily or whatever but like that 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 feels like the wanky practitioner term. If she called herself like a bad item magnet or something, I'd be like, yeah, that works. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to call out a prediction from Tassawat that was made in length at our um on our Discord, but uh, the summarized version is in in the Power Predictor. Um, basically, Tassawat thinks Lucy will become an agent of the Sable at the end of the story. Basically, just uh, being a bit of a guidance counselor sort of thing for him like like you know offering this valuable viewpoint she has as like a different type of 
judge, but not as a judge, just as like, I guess an mm. advisor he turns to, uh, uh, like, yeah. Um, to saw it specifically mentions Lucy being one of his agents. So yeah, just like complimenting him, not as another judge, but as one of his agents. And mm. I'm kind of a big fan of this because I think it satisfies a lot of like, you know, the benefits we'd see for Lucy as a judge, but without her actually having to become one of these judges because that sucks. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also think, I, like, I don't know, it brings to mind the idea, like, I kind of think part of the problem with the judge system as it exists in Ontario at the moment in the story is like how isolated the judges are from everything. Mm. And so like the idea of them having agents like this who also just have their own lives going on and like, you know, they're consulting with practitioners and stuff. I mean, this is what Pale's been talking to death about is that that sort of isolation isn't good. And so I think having agents like Lucy who are not just working with the judges mm. um feels like an important step for making the judge roles work better after the story because mm. when they're off isolated from practitioner practitioners isolated from others kind of doing their own thing i don't think they can function that well mm. yeah hmm. yeah yeah it's an interesting position i guess and would represent a nice kind of fundamental change that could, could yeah change the way the judges work to make them more i don't know future proof yeah but like there's there's another side to that which is you don't want the judges to be like like i I can see the logic for the isolation because you don't want the judges to be partisan i mean we've got two partisan judges right now in in this fictional ontario supreme court and it's not good like charles and the orum are even worse judges because they're less isolated from the rest of what's going on um so it's not like the isolation is just raw bad. I, I get the logic, but like, there's got to be a better way. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it, yeah. counting counting on isolation is about is as bad a call as letting someone like Charles do what he's doing to it. Yeah, I think so. <sighs> but this, I don't know. Yeah, I, I yeah. don't feel like. I feel like any conversation that talks about changing the system to a different system that is not dependent on just like giving people the ability to govern, self govern, is just flawed. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, again, this is Team Kenneth. We're looking at like the baby steps approach. And I don't think you can just wipe the judges off the board. So it's kind of like, is there a, is there a way we can better integrate them? so we can slowly phase them out or, or just make them work better as they currently stand. Mm. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> we'll have to see. We'll have to see. I don't know. Uh, I don't, I don't know if I feel confident enough to make predictions about <laughs> the, no, the yeah, systems yeah. that are, are going to be the way the world works at the end of the story, I guess. <laughs> I just I can't see a way Kenneth lets the judges keep operating as completely independent entities that don't communicate with everyone else. Because mm. like I think even when we've seen the judges work in this story, like before the Orum and Carmine were blatantly corrupt, mm. like they were so disconnected from everything that it just wasn't working. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very true. That they're, they're clearly the Sable, especially, is like clearly just too disconnected from the reality of what's going on in the world, right? Yeah, and you know, so was the old Alabaster, but we yes took care of that. Yeah, that's been resolved. <laughs> um. So yeah, the, the, thank you for leaving predictions, folks who left predictions. Uh, if you want to leave a prediction, you can find the link to our pale predictor form in the show notes down below. Uh, yeah, and with that, should we get into our discussion question, uh, which last week was, what part of Gray's arguments resonate the most with you? Do you think any part of Charles's plan is salvageable? Mm. We got a lot of fun responses to this one. Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, I think we got a lot of people who agreed with some of the things we said in our previous episode, and a lot of people who talked about not a lot of Charles' plan practically being salvageable, <laughs> but some some interesting points were definitely raised in favor of um in favor of the plan. So yeah, a good a good kind of spread. Yeah, I I think like a, a big sentiment was a lot of people. Uh, yeah, I agree with that idea that like great like well so to just dive into how Ace of Swords put it, um, 
the part of Gray's argument that resonates with me is that forswearing is a bad thing and is an emergency and somebody needs and something needs to be done about it. Like I think that was the thing that was really hard to argue against with Gray and Avery ran into is it. like that's kind of a fair point. Mm, yeah. Um Ace of Sword just brings up that like what what what's happening with Gray and stuff is that they don't realize that like Charles has kind of moved the goalposts a bit there. Like his plan yes. is now talking about taking centuries anyway. So like, yes. is it is it that much like is it that much quicker? Is it that much better than the Kennedy's plan? Like, is a good question at this point actually. Yeah, I did really like that point, which is like sure if the Kennedys implement something, they can do that immediately in the local area, and it will still take time then to propagate around the world. But Charles's plan is already going to take that time, right? So, the the one benefit that Charles's plan has, which is the speed and kind of radicalness of it, is quickly being overpowered by what the Kennedys are doing already. Yeah, and I just kind of refuse to believe that the Crucible realistically is going to get to the point where it's powerful enough to do Seal two point globally right away i assume there's going to be propagation wait like, hell the seal took well thousands of years to reach north america right so like yeah it, well, it's like, a slow uh, process <laughs> yeah like, like it seems unrealistic to expect seal 2.0 to be powerful enough to be instantly global it's still maybe quicker than the kennedy's one but it's still going to take time to propagate i'd expect yeah yeah um I also really liked Ace of Sword brought up the the logic here of like the way Gray and stuff talked about Mr. Allaire and how they'd like work for him if he was doing something. There's just like a bit of a fool me once uh, issue here because they're trying to do good again, but they're working for a complete monster yeah. who has fooled them. And it's like, it is just a bit, they're just repeating the same mistakes, which I guess that's why Charles likes them because yeah. that's his MO as well. <laughs> They fit in very well with him. Yeah, that's that's the part of him. That's the part of them that makes sense to him is the repeating your same stupid mistakes. Yeah, um, we got an answer from Sentient Pebble, which uh, pointed out the flaw with Charles's plan is that it's Charles judging, making a judge of character. I think a lot of people pointed this out. I think we talked about it last yeah. week. I mean, we just can't. <laughs> yeah, we just can't trust Charles to be a good judge of character, right? No, uh, wait, the, the dude has acknowledged in the story that he has an established history of picking the worst people to hang out with. Yeah. Um, so it is pretty funny that he's still somehow confident in his ability to design the rules for what a good person will look like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just can't trust him. Yeah. Um, I liked Olafax's point that... Um, uh, like basically, they're focused on the part that, like, Charles is essentially admitting that he doesn't have a plan. He doesn't have the skills to implement change. So he's essentially just building a whole plan that hopes other people will do good. Like the, uh, like none of his plan is salvageable because his plan essentially relies on some, somebody else will be better than me. I can't do it. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is not a great, it no, doesn't a, inspire confidence. Yeah. And and um, I I do think Olafak brought up a good point as well that like the Alair Forsworn are able to make this argument as convincing as they are though because like they're so de- like they're clearly deeply traumatized by what, what's happened. Like Olafak brings out they're skittish around Avery, which is like she's you know the least threatening person on the planet. Mm. Um, so like I think that like that's a good point that Olafak brings up. Like that helps demonstrate how bad a place they're in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what other question, uh, responses did you really like, yeah. Elliot? I guess. I, ho- so the way Hobo Demon phrased yeah. this is burn <laughs> yeah, down yeah, on the yeah. last. <laughs> this is crazy because <laughs> I was just looking up the, the ones who walk away from on the last earlier today before I was looking at the discussion question answers <laughs> and Why? then it showed up. It was crazy. Cause I, cause I couldn't remember, um, who had written it. And I was checking who had written it. It was Ursula Le Guin. Le Guin, right. And then it just came up in the discussion question answer like 30 minutes later. Anyway, yeah, it's it's well summed up by Hobo Demon. Like, they at least know what they're trying to get towards, which is a system that doesn't require a sacrificial lamb or whatever. Um, yeah. In the Omelas sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, just the thing that I really liked about Hobo Demon's answer was the 
this quote, history does not end. When a system is overthrown, what replaces it is often shaped by somebody seeking power and by definition unfit to wield it, which, yeah, is one of my big problems with Charles' system because he's just kind of assuming that, well, get into this great new utopia and then everyone will act in the way that I want them to act. (laughs) Yeah, like the issue I have with Charles's idea here is like, I guess this is the thing, like, the new system is always going to inherit to inherit philosophies from the old system. Like you can't you can't just go back to scratch and design a new civilization mm. from first principles. And we know that's true because the crucible is going to send you into post seal times as part of the test. It wants you to understand that post the seal sucks, but that still means that like you're coming out of it. Like the successful applicant is coming out of it with the uh, like that as a model for a shape of society. So like you're still not building a new system from scratch because you're heavily being influenced by the existing system right now. Um, and like it, it's almost like Kenneth is just more open about that. The thing that gets me is like sure it'll be a new system, but it'll still have the same people in it, right? Like the same people who yeah operate in a way that tries to exploit the system to their maximum benefit. Uh, it's just how it works. I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah, and like you know, deprogramming yourself from that shit is hard. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I thought Pyrrhus had a good point though in defense of the plan, which is that the fact that the Crucible takes you through pre-seal times to now will explicitly force you to recognize kind of the intention of the seal and its flaws so in that way the person who creates it assuming that they're acting in the way that charles intends which is altruistic will be able to at least learn somewhat from the failings of the seal to address its original intent which is at least a kind of iterative improvement to an extent yeah because humans definitely have a habit of you know they're, they're like a a restriction or a rule or a thing will exist and humans will be like why we don't want this anymore let's get rid of it and that's the quickest way to learn why it was built in the first place right like mm. i do this with things that i'm programming all the time where i'm like ah, oh, this isn't doing anything i don't need this and then i'll delete a line of code and it turns out it was doing something i just didn't realize um and i think that's essentially the point piranus is bringing up here is like you don't want to undo or alter parts of the seal and reopen old bugs in the system. Yes. Um, so having somebody who's aware of what shit was, used to look like is important. Yes. yes. Um, I'd argue that Kenneth has that through people who existed before the seal mm. uh, on their team. But yeah, like it's it's an important factor. Yeah. 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 I, and again, obviously, this is making a lot of assumptions about what will it actually work and will the person be as altruistic as Charles wants. But. Of course, you know, yeah. I guess assuming all that is true. <laughs> yeah, I like to have this argument kind of based on the assumption that, like, uh, Charles has things in place to help him pick somebody who, like, will be well-motivated according to his definition of well-motivated because mm. it's just objectively a shit plan if that's not the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But, yeah, so, uh, oh, yeah, normal non-Eldritch guy had a pretty good one as well, which was um, the the best part of Charles' plan is that he's using power given by the international community to affect change. And you do have to pay Charles for this one. (laughs) Like, despite all his shit, he is... It, there's a vibe to it of like you taking institutional power and using it against the institution, which is very fun yeah. conceptually. Yeah, he's like the shittiest Robin Hood ever, but you still get you still get that shred of Robin Hood cred, right? Like, yeah, exactly, like- exactly, exactly. <laughs> he's at least slightly Robin Hood esque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and I mean, yeah, that's that's the thing with Charles is he's always been just a few steps short of being on Team Goody. Like, we agree with him on stuff like that, so. You can give him the credit for fucking over London, which we're presumably all good with. Yeah. Um, I also really liked normal non-Eldritch guy brought up a point um, and expressed it a lot better than I think I've ever managed to, but I've certainly felt, which is Gray kind of helps us remember that like the Kennedy's position of really incremental change is kind of a position you can take when you're in a privileged position. Like, 
it's easy for the Kenneteers who are relatively well-off practitioners since they awoke to argue for incremental change because they're not forsworn. Like it's it's understandable why so many forsworn and like Musser's ex-familiars have flocked to his side because uh, they've suffered from the worst of it. And it's like, it, it is a bit easier when you haven't been hit by it directly to, to come at it from a less emotional standpoint. Mm. Mm. And so I'm easily impressed. You, you say things like in the trio's defense, their incremental change is fast as fuck. They've done this in less than a year. They would not be where they are right now if Charles hadn't done shit. Like I yes, think it's true. We need to cop that. Is like in the world where they won Arc Thirteen, Musser is still around. Like their their incremental change was going to be a lot slower. They're kind of piggybacking off the shit Charles has yeah. been tearing up. And Charles that's not has ideal, ripped up like, a lot yeah. of stuff already that has made opportunities for change, and that's good to an extent but also pretty bad to an extent <laughs> yeah yeah exactly I like that's this is the worst thing i remember we talked about this like in arc 14 is it's going to kind of suck that whatever ontario looks like at the end of this story if it's any way remotely good charles is unfortunately due some credit for that for the wrong reasons but well, you can't avoid the fact that he destabilized things enough that the kennedys could do what they did yeah which yeah sucks but is what it is yeah <laughs> Um, um what we ones? had uh yeah. propaganda pagodas I wanted to call out, um which it, it was a long and, and pretty intricate response, um, but I've essentially just boiled it down to propaganda pagoda thinks Charles is too focused on there being like a simple strategy, like a rule, like like Charles is convinced there's a thing we did wrong, and if we do a thing differently, then we can solve all the problems. And it's a mm. thing that people do in real life all the time. Um humans like to try and believe well, the problems without nuance are the ones that we can fix relatively easily so of course we kind of hope ourselves into thinking big problems can be like that too and this is like what charles is doing to himself is he's too determined to view this as a problem that has a fix mm. um and yeah like so basically all proper propaganda pagoda sees are salvageable from this plan are like there's little granules like the idea like charles is big ticket things like get rid of for swearing like just the stuff we already agreed with him on is really all that's salvageable but like propaganda pagoda leaves his course be, uh, believes his core strategy is just too misguided to really be functional at all mm, yeah i mean that is it right <laughs> yeah i don't i don't disagree uh, with Charles. this answer at all yeah um another takedown of charles that i liked is t cell watts which was Tisa what said the part that stood out to me really was it can't be static because morality changes over time. And yeah, again, like I think yeah. we talked about this last episode, the seal probably was a pretty decent plan back yeah. in that before time, but just, yeah, nah, not anymore. Yeah. And that's where like the seal is a metaphor for like the U S constitution comes in. Cause it's like, mm. you see the shit with the second amendment <laughs> It's like the Second Amendment made sense when guns were big muskets that took ten seconds to reload or whatever. Mm. But now that you've got machine guns, it's it, it, it like the shit. The environment has changed, and the Constitution needs to be amended again yeah. uh, to keep up. Um, yeah. and yeah, like the, that's the problem. Like if you have a Constitution like the Seal that doesn't support amendments, it, it, yeah, it's it's never going to work. But I guess <laughs> maybe Charles is hoping his person will be clever enough to think of that. Yeah. So I just I can't I can't put together in my head a vision of what Charles thinks the seal 2.0 is going to look like that isn't basically just what Kenneth is trying to do and that's what really drives me nuts about this plan is I don't like why doesn't he just give this power to Kenneth anyway and I know that yeah, anyway yeah um uh okay, last thing I wanted to call out was uh from Vice Versailles and she brought up a number of good points mm. but um I really liked the idea that like she vice versa i kept saying last week that gray was trying to turn it into a trolley problem and i think what vice versa brings up here that i really liked is for gray like that trolley problem is very real like the forsworn or x forsworn have kind of been hit by the trolley essentially um so you can understand why in their worldview they keep turning this stuff into a trolley problem because they've kind of seen it um and it's all very well for Avery to kind of sit there and be like, oh, that's not fair. And I question that chance and like, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, it's not fair to turn this into a trolley problem. But when you've been hit by the trolley, of course, you're going to fall back on that. Mm, yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, I mean, I think something that Vice Versailles brings up that I really like is the concept of ensuring that you give the power to affect structural change to the most disenfranchised people is kind of a fun brute force way of ensuring that the world is equitable and safe for all, even if it might take a few iterations. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that. Like, I do to an extent, like, obviously just letting the people who are succeeding in the current system change it is never going to work because yes. they like the system as is. Yes, yes. Um, but, like, I think Charles and his ex Sworn are uh, uh, exactly the argument against why giving it to the most disenfranchised is going to be problematic in the other way because, uh, uh, like, the Forsworn are justifiably bitter and shitty about society and this is why their team burn it down like it's you need you need that mix and cooperation like it's it's less about giving like i would argue against giving the most power to affect structural change to the most disenfranchised but i would argue that they need to be in the fucking conversations you know like you know what i mean Mm. like this is that difference between team charles and team kennett i think is kennett doesn't want to give all the power to the most disenfranchised their whole point is we all should have like the same access to the power whereas charles and co just kind of flipping it and it creates the same dynamic but the other way Mm, yeah and yeah as vice versa is pointing out in the chat right now once again what i've done in managing to fix charles's plan is just recreate kennett's which just keeps (laughs) keeps happening so maybe they're on maybe they've maybe they've cracked it yeah (laughs) Ah, but thank you everyone for leaving your uh your discussion question answers there's a lot of yeah i think um Maybe it's because we're all reading this story from the perspective of the Kennedys, but it was tough to come up with uh, justifications for old Charles, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, but I, I think people brought up a bunch of really interesting ways of thinking about it that I certainly had. Like, I got new appreciation for why I don't like Charles's plan out of this discussion question, which I think is like the goal of asking something like this. Mm, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hot, hot, pale reflections take is we think the plan kind of sucks. Mm, yeah yeah <laughs> we should have now just, we, we, we should have just committed to a bit imagine if we just were pro crucible that would have been a really it would have been fun <laughs> it probably would have gotten frustrating to listen to pretty quick but yeah we should have just pretended that we were into it mm. um but yeah so we we do have a new discussion question for next week of course um this one comes to us uh with credit to idillo in the discord thank you idillo um This discussion question is, what measurement systems do other realms use, like Warrens, Ruins, etc.? So, you know, we've got smidges and dabs and all that jazz for uh, measuring out glamour. But uh, what what measurement systems would the other realms use? Leave your answers in the discussion thread. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we've seen fleshmongers from the Warrens. I'm curious what those be, but then also other aspects to the Warrens. Like, there's so many... Angles, you could take this. The mm. paths are probably all over the fucking shop. I wonder if they have like unit conversion things. Anyway, yeah. So yeah. hit us up with your answers on what what measurement systems other parts of this universe use. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can leave your answers to that in the discussion thread, which you can find linked in the show notes down below. Uh, there you can also find links to our Twitter, where we post a hot and fresh new pale meme every single day, at least while tw- Twitter still <laughs> exists. Um, yeah, I don't know where that side anymore yeah um uh but a site that is far more reliable and cool is doofmedia.com that's where you can find out all the stuff about shows on the doof media network uh gosh i think they're finally doing it on kingslingers right now so it's a great time to go check out kingslingers yeah fucking great good good one thanks I hate you. <laughs> They're doing it on Kingslingers. Oh, well, that show is a lot more explicit than I thought. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's where that's where the doof adult content is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's called Doof After Dark for a reason. <laughs> um, oh Jesus Christ! What are we talking about? <laughs> oh yeah, if you want uh, to support the Doof Media Network, become a patron. Go to patreon.com forward slash Doof Media, and you can uh, get all kinds of bonus content and extra things. Or just support us for the sake of supporting us. You know, that's good too. Yep. And don't forget to stop by Wildbo's Patreon as well. Patreon.com forward slash Wildbo. And you know, even if you're already Patreoning him, consider increasing it. Go from a dash to a smidgen. Or, you know, hit him up with a whole gill of, of, of your money. Mm. Yeah. Um, um, cool. Oh, it's time for my pick Here we line. go, Elliot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> hey, baby. If I pretended to be an other, do you think you and I could get familiar? Yeah.